In a prior video, we have introduced the concept of the equilibrium constant uh, for a reaction that is reversible A to give products B. We have said that the equilibrium constant can be written as follows. Capital K is simply going to be the concentration of products uh, to the power of the stoichiometric coefficient in that product one over the concentration of reagents to the power of the stoichiometric coefficient in that uh, species, which is one. Now, uh, this is a simplification, and of course it only works if you have uh, reagents and products being uh, solutes in an aqueous solution. What the question is, what happens when you have gases, or when you have one liquid, or when you have solids involved in the chemical reaction? How do we generalize this uh, expression for the equilibrium constant to be able to capture uh, all of those gases, solids, liquids, and so forth? Right, as it turns out, uh, what happens here is that uh, this is a simplification of what the equilibrium constant really is. So what we do in this video is we, we take a look uh, in detail, uh, in full uh, depth, to what the equilibrium constant really is, and then how we uh, get to this simplification of the equilibrium constant. In reality, uh, the equilibrium constant can always be written using something that is called the activities of reagents and products. Okay, so we're going to take a very generic reaction uh, with two reagents. Okay. A, B to give C and D, and then you have uh, low case stoichiometric coefficients. And uh, the way that you could define the equilibrium constant that is correct uh, is as follows. Uh, you use, instead of using molar concentrations as we have done until now, you use something that is called an activity. An activity has the letter uh, A, and it's just a placeholder for a concentration or an effective measure of a concentration. Because the way that this would work for this reaction would be the activity of product C to the power of the stoichiometric coefficient of the product, which is C, multiplied by the activity of the other product D to the power of that stoichiometric coefficient over the activities of reagents A and the activity of the other reagent B. Okay? Now, it turns out that we can then use these activities, which are placeholders for uh, measures of concentration, and then replace them with uh, an effective or, or a useful measure of concentration, depending on whether these A, B, C, and Ds are gases or liquids or solids and so forth. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do here is write a map that tells you uh, how to turn those activities, which are just generic and placeholding, for uh, measures of concentrations that we can handle in the laboratory and in, pro and in problems. Okay, so for example, if uh, your product A, B, C, or D happens to be a solute in an aqueous solution, then uh, the activity of that component, which we're going to call generically J, is simply going to be the more concentration of that species divided over a reference concentration, which is one molar. And this is something new. Okay, we already knew that uh, the activity was related to the molar concentration. That is the approximation that we had uh, been using until now. Okay, but something that is kind of a twist is that all of these uh, molar concentrations are actually divided by something that is called a reference concentration, which uh, by convenience and arbitrarily, uh, we have all agreed that it's going to be one molar. Okay, and this is going to be very important because it turns out that every time that you divide those concentrations by that reference concentration, the units cancel. And that means that uh, in the end, uh, the equilibrium constants uh, all have, the all are dimensional, as they will not have any units. And again, the reason is that uh, when we define these activities, we're always dividing those more concentrations or the pressures, as we will see for gases, by a reference concentration, which uh, is used to cancel the units. Okay, so again, uh, if this is a solute, then in terms of the activity, you simply uh, can come to this expression, and if any one of these is a solute, you simply replace that activity by the molar concentration of that solute, divided by one molar, and then you're good. Okay, uh, what happens if you have a gas? Well, if the, if the product is a gas, if the species is a gas, then uh, the way that you map an activity into a useful measure of concentration is by using the partial pressure of that gas, P sub J, and here, you also have to divide over a reference concentration, which, uh, in fact, is one bar, okay? And this pressure should have units of bar as well. 
Notice that when you put here uh, the pressure of the component J in units of bar and divide over one bar, then the, uni ca the units cancel, and uh, overall the uh, equilibrium constant will be dimensionless as well. Now, uh, for all intents and purposes um, in, in, our, in our work, uh, we're not going to be using bar, we will be using atmosphere instead. That is an approximation, but it's a sensible one because the difference between uh, atmosphere and bar is only about 1%. Okay, so uh, we're more used to working in atmospheres, uh, even though in reality those activities have to have units of bar and they're divided for one, uh, by one bar. And again, you will see how in problems we will simply plug in here the partial pressures in atmospheres and then the reference pressure will be one atmosphere. All right, so again, this means that if any of these uh, uh, species happen to be a gas, you come to the Gruyan constant and simply replace that activity of that particular gaseous species by uh, the partial pressure divided over one bar. Okay, great. Now, uh, what happens if you have a solid or a liquid? Okay, so if, if there's only one liquid, that means that the liquid is pure. Uh, so if you have only one li liquid, right, so if you have a liquid and it's pure or a solid, it turns out that the activities are very simple. They just have, by uh, agreement, okay, uh, a completely uh, uh, this is all agreed upon, the activities of any pure liquid that you have in your reaction or any solid okay, will all be one. Okay, so that means that if you have any solid in this reaction or uh, uh, a liquid, and there's only one liquid in either reagent or products, then you actually have that the activities of those when you plug in the agreement constant are going to be just one. All right, so this is the uh, defective map to turn activities into uh, measures, of con measures of concentration that are useful in the laboratory. What we're going to do now is see how this uh, applies to a couple of uh, specific ex examples so that you can see how this mapping works. All right, let's return to one equilibrium that we had in a prior video, which is the equilibrium between glucose 6-phosphate, which is a solute in an aqueous solution, and an isomer, which is fructose 6-phosphate, which is also a solute in an aqueous solution. All right, uh, in the prior video, we have written this uh, equilibrium constant simply as the concentration of products, fructose 6-phosphate, over the concentration of reagents, glucose 6-phosphate. What we're going to do now is use the more accurate uh, expression for the equilibrium constant and see how that reduces to this simple shorthand uh, notation that we have used before. Right, so the way that you would do uh, this in uh, the correct form would be to write the equilibrium constant simply as saying that, well, that is going to be the activity of my product, which is uh, fructose 6-phosphate, to the power of the stoichiometric coefficient, which is 1, over the activity of glucose 6-phosphate, to the power of the activity coefficient, which is 1 as well. All right, so uh, you would come here and say, well, this is fine. You have here those activities. Now, how do we map those? into useful measures of concentration. You come to this table and recognize that these are simply solutes in an aqueous solution, okay, where the solvent is water. Then the mapping is going to be the concentration over the reference concentration, which is one molar. Right? So this would turn into the concentration of fructose, 6-phosphate, over one molar, over the concentration of glucose, 6-phosphate, over one molar. But this would be the correct expression for the equilibrium constant. Now notice that if you apply these concentrations in molarity, in units of molarity, these one molars are going to cancel and all of the units are going to cancel. So effectively, what will happen is that your final equilibrium constant is going to be the concentration of glucose uh, fructose 6-phosphate or the glucose 6-phosphate, which is exactly how we had uh, first written that equilibrium constant in that prior video. But here you can see where this short notation really comes from. Okay, it start, starts from the activities, which is the correct way to define the equilibrium constant, and then you go through the uh, mapping of the activities into useful measures of concentration, and finally you just simplify uh, to get a shorthand version of that equilibrium constant. Okay, so this is one example uh, to show that mapping of activities into something useful. We're going to use a second example involving gases, so that you can see uh, how this continues to uh, to work. The reaction that we're going to be using for gases is going to be uh, the Haber synthesis of ammonia, where you have nitrogen 
which is a gas reacting with hydrogen, which is a gas as well, to generate ammonia, which when you're working at high temperatures is also a gas. All right, so the question then would be, how do you write the equilibrium constant for this particular reaction, for this chemical equilibrium? Well, uh, you always start with the activities. You would say, well, I have the activity of products, which is ammonia, elevated to the power of the stoichiometric coefficient. Here you have a stoichiometric coefficient of 2, so that will be squared, and then divided over the products of the activities of reagents, where you have that one of them is nitrogen, uh, elevated to the power of the stoichiometric coefficient of 1, this is 1, multiplied by the activity of the other one, which is H2, and this is elevated to the power of the stoichiometric coefficient, which is 3. Okay, this is fine, that's where you start. And now, uh, activities are not very useful by themselves. We would like to map them into something that we can measure. And in this case, for gases, it turns out that it's, it's very easy to measure pressures. Right, so the way, uh, the way that we do this is, uh, these are all gases, so we're going to be using this map. Notice that uh, for ammonia, you will have that this uh, maps into the partial pressure of ammonia divided over one bar. And then all of this is squared. And it's important that you have to square also the denominator, okay, so that the units cancel. And then you have that this will be the partial pressure of nitrogen, one bar. Okay. And then the partial pressure of hydrogen over one bar, and then the stoichiometric coefficient here is three, so you have a power of three there. Okay, that is a true uh, expression for the equilibrium constant for uh, this reaction, which is the Haber synthesis of ammonia. Now, uh, usually what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be canceling this or, or uh, neglecting these uh, reference states of one bar, and uh, the shorthand notation that we will use for this equilibrium constant would be this. That is P and H3 squared over P and 2 pH2 cubed. But there's something important when you go from here to there, and that is to recognize that here you must plug in uh, the pressures in either bar or atmosphere, and then the final equilibrium constant will be dimensionless, no units. Okay, and that would be misleading. Uh, if you think, if you don't take that step, right? Because if you think about uh, simply plugging here pressures, notice that in the numerator you will have bar squared or atmosphere squared, and in the denominator you will have atmosphere fourths, right? So the units, uh, if you don't use this, uh, would turn it uh, would turn it to be atmosphere to the minus two, but that is not true. It turns that that uh, uh, the true uh, form of the equilibrium constant is this, and then if you plug in those pressures right here. All of those units would cancel, and your equilibrium constant will be dimensionless, which is the way that they should be. Uh, however, we just don't want have, we don't want to write uh, the equilibrium uh, sort of the reference pressures all the time. So we're going to be using a, a shorthand notation. But then, even if we use this shorthand notation, we are aware that uh, the final units of the equilibrium constant will be dimensionless. Okay? Uh, the equilibrium constants do not have any dimensions at all. And again, that is the, uh, finally, that is because in the true form, all of these pressures are divided by something that is called a reference state, which simply cancels the units. Okay? All right, so in this video, we have seen a, a, a more deep version of what the equilibrium constant is for a generic chemical reaction. It turns out that generally, we define the equilibrium constant in terms of something that is called activities. And activities are just um, uh, placeholders for measures of concentration. Now, we can use a map to turn those activities into something that is useful, like molar concentrations for solutes in, in solutions, or partial pressures for gases, and then if we have pure liquids and solids, then we also have those activities as well. Okay? And uh, that's how you rewrite those uh, equilibrium constants.